Hi everybody, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel, and today I have a little bit of a thank you to give all of you YouTube viewers. Uh, over the over the last several years, uh, since I've had my YouTube channel up, I'm very happy to say that I really haven't received any negative feedback at all. A few, you know, a few, some some little things here and there, but nothing nothing blatantly insulting or mean uh, i think that that the the whole lot of you whoever who has written comments on my youtube channel have been incredibly helpful incredibly encouraging uh offering great feedback asking great questions starting conversations it's been really really awesome and for that i've i've really enjoyed my youtube channel and that's one of the things that really leads me to wanting to create more and better content for you guys so one of the things i thought i would do today for the first time i have actually done this before on my youtube channel it's a bit overdue is do a little bit of a q a so i got i i gathered some some questions that i felt everybody could benefit from and and answer them to all of you, a answer them to all of you on my YouTube channel, and uh, it's actually a bit of a technique that I learned on uh, from teaching myself. But it was that wasn't actually anything that had to do with art in general. It was something that I actually learned when I was a part of a, a salsa dance troupe. The head of our troupe, when he was when he was uh, when we were doing our choreography at one point, he mentioned because uh, he had been doing it, he he's been teaching dance for a long time, and he said, when you're a teacher, if a student asks you a question. And this is, an, if, if any of you are ever aspiring to teach yourself, this is something that, that I can pass along to you as well. If a student asks you a question, you don't answer that student directly, you answer to the whole class. So the student will ask you a question, then you direct your answer to everybody in the class. Because chances are, many other people in that class also had the same question, just didn't think of asking it. And it's something that very often everybody can benefit from. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to take some of your questions that I found on, you know, I went through a bunch of my different videos and stuff. And I made a compilation of the ones that I felt that everybody could benefit from, and I'm answering them to you guys, to, so that everybody who watches my YouTube channel can benefit from that very good question. All right. Now, just a little quick mention is, in a few occasions, because I'm from Quebec, because I'm bilingual, and because I teach in both languages, I teach in English and French, a few comments that sometimes come up, a few questions that come up sometimes are in French as well. So in that particular case, the majority are English, but the one, when when I do get a French question, I'll read it in French and then I'll translate it into English and my answer will be in English and French as well. That way, if you're a French listener, if you're from France or from Quebec or if you're French speaking, um, then you'll be able to benefit from the answer as well. All right. But I'll only be doing that for the questions that are uh, uh, that I do receive in French. All right. And uh, I think that's it. So let's get to the first question. All right, so our first question comes from Aklimovich94. I don't know if you're a man or a woman, so uh, I'll just address it generally. Um, I have a hard time being an artist at the moment. I'm just a beginner, and I can hardly achieve anything, even though I want to be a professional. I'm really a step away from giving up, but thank you for your inspiring words, especially the introvert speech. It really helps me stay strong. I love this question, and the reason why is because every single bloody artist on earth, be you a complete beginner, intermediate, or an advanced artist, we all feel this. And it's not just, we don't just feel it this at one point in our career. It's periodic. It comes and goes, okay? And sometimes, depending on how much you're producing, that roller coaster of ups and downs throughout your career isn't a wide wave like that. It's like this. <laughs> I'm great. I suck. I'm great. I suck. I'm great. I suck, okay? So the fact that you feel this way means you're an artist. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Here's your ticket, okay? That's a very, very normal part of being an artist. And this is very much why with with as a teacher, when I teach, I don't only address the um, the technical side of art, but the emotional side of art as well, the personal side. This is a very good example of what I'm talking about. Okay. As an artist, when I'm producing my own artwork and any professional artist on earth that is public about their experiences as art. A good example is uh, Steven Silver, the cartoonist, just put out a video on his channel, um, Overcoming the Guilt of Not Drawing. It's a good video, so I suggest checking it out. It illustrates the fact that even a guy like him, you know, even a guy like Steven, who with the success that he's had in his career, he's got a beautiful studio, the whole bit, even a guy like him goes through rough patches. We all go through rough patches. I can be, and when I'm, things are going well and my clients are paying me and I'm doing well and I'm proud of the artwork that I'm doing and blah, 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 I feel great. I'm on cloud nine. But then just as easily, it feels like sometimes something can knock me off, off my feet and 
it's like pulling the plug on my ability to draw. And all of a sudden it's going, yesterday I could draw and today I can't draw. Nah! I get all emotional and pissy about myself. And the negative, de the, the, the demons start to float into my head and start filling my heads with all this negative, these negative thoughts. And, you know, and, I, and I fight through it, fight through it, and then I get at the other end and, I, and then I'm, I'm good again. <laughs> it's like living with a schizophrenic if you have an artist in your house, you know. So that feeling is totally normal. So what have I done? What do I do? What are my personal uh, techniques on getting over? It? Well, the first thing is my perspective. One of the things that changed in my career, in my whole understanding of the artistic and the growth part process of being an artist, is at the beginning when I would have these shitty days, these shitty times where I was really like, honestly, like 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 Aklimovich wrote, you want to give up. You know, you're almost ready to give up. If I'm suck, I'm not good enough. I didn't have any point of reference in my career at that point yet. I was like a Klimovich. I was new. I was I was I was a fresh seedling, thrown into the air on my little fluff, you know, floating through the air, waiting for a place to land, and um, uh, because I hadn't landed yet, when I did experience that, I really questioned my entire career. Okay, and that didn't entirely go away. What would happen is, what's changed between then and now is, today when that happens, I just, even though I still feel shitty, I recognize that as being a process, it's, it's an occupational hazard of being an artist. We're emotional creatures, our artwork is a reflection of us, right? So if our reflection doesn't reflect back to us the way we want, want it to, we get pissy about it, right? It, it affects us emotionally. So when I, when I experience that, I know from experiences, just get through it. So how do you get through it? I don't want to sit there in a funk for six months. I've been there, right? So how do I get over that? Well, the first thing that I learned was very often I have these feelings. I very often struggle to produce any artwork that I value when I'm thinking about the technical before I think about the creative. And what I mean by that is I regard, I've learned to regard in my own artwork, I've learned to regard the technical side of art, you know, the rendering, the structure, the anatomy, the foreshortening, the perspective, all that kind of stuff. I regard that as what comes in after, okay? It's how I take an idea and flesh it out into something concrete. But if I jump into a painting, but the other side of that is the creative side. The creative side is the emotional side, the thinking side, the experiencing side where you can close your eyes and you can visualize a scene or a moment or a character and what they're like, right? So when I try to jump into a painting technically right away, I'm in, I'm at, in my head, I'm thinking I'm going to draw an ogre and he's going to wear these clothes and he's going to be holding this mace and he's going to be posing as such. I'm setting myself up for, for disappointment because I'm thinking technically. I'm thinking about the physical structure of his armor and his muscles, but I haven't created a character. To me, the word character means a personality. I'm creating a personality. So how do I overcome that? I, I think when I'm actually conceptualizing or visualizing a character in my brain before I start to draw it, I think about the emotion behind it. I'm thinking about the what is the situation that this character is living? What is their, What are they feeling? What do I want my audience to feel? So instead of just doing an arc standing there with a thing, maybe I might think about the fact that he just got shot with an arrow and it hit him right in the in the abdomen, which is extremely painful. But he's a warrior, so he's in terrible pain, like oh, like this. But he's still going and attacking, so that that pain is making him even more powerful because he's fighting the pain. So it's giving him this extra bit of incentive and rage to fight, right? So instead of him just being, dink, right? Instead, he's in pain. And he's oh, like this, and the expression on. I can think of an expression on his face. I can think about an emotion. I can think about an angle because all of that plays into the narrative of his emotion. And once I've fleshed it out very loosely. I'm not thinking technically at all. I'm just thinking about the pose and everything like that. Very loose drawing. Then I come in with the technica technical side of things and I flesh this out into something concrete and I've already got a good base to go with. It's a lot easier at that point. So that's a good trick. The last thing I want to mention about this, about this question is understand the artistic learning curve. It's not like math, okay? Uh, math is you learn this equation, you work through it, you work through it, solution. You get this problem, you work through it, you work through it, solution. That's a very that's a the very mathematical way of problem solving. For every for every problem, there is an answer. For every problem, there's an answer. The artistic learning curve, and I've learned this over and over and over again, is not like this. It's like this. 
it's flat line, flat line, flat line, flat line. And during this whole time, you're studying, you're practicing, and nothing's fucking happening. It's very frustrating. And then all of a sudden, you have what's called an epiphany. And your learning curve goes, whoop, like this. It just b jumps. And all of a sudden, you know, like, you know, like in Aladdin, a whole new world, one little clue finally clicks. And... All of a sudden, everything makes sense, and your artwork makes leaps and bounds. That's where you make. That's why very often artists have these really big jumps in their skill. They practice, 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 practice. Nothing happens, and then all of a sudden, this new artist just pops out of the woodworks like you never even knew he or she existed. You know, so understand that side of it as well. When you, if you don't necessarily see immediate improvement in your work, it doesn't mean you're not improving. You're uh, there's a lot that goes behind solidifying a solid answer that'll make that jump happen okay now the more you work the more often that's gonna happen of course if you do nothing nothing's gonna happen but just understand that side of it all right hopefully that answer uh, answers your questions let's jump on to the next one all right our next question comes from heavy transit heavy transit writes what ha what happens if I like all of the three things I sometimes want to design and sometimes tell stories uh, I'm working in a game right now as a designer and concept artist, and at the same time, I'm doing illustration work in an illustration collective. Is that wrong? I don't know at the moment. I'm also doing lettering for logo design, uh, but I don't find any of these activities to be a burden to my work. I've found that all of them combined make me stronger on the rest. I sometimes hear that being a jack of all trades is wrong, but I just found myself restricted or uncomfortable. I sometimes spend hours and hours on a piece that I want to that I want to make really telling, and sometimes I just sketch designs of helmets and vehicles. I'm confused. Yes. Okay. That's. A, I, I like this question as well because this. What he's talking about basically is, you know, where do I go with my career? Where am I going with my career? Um, I like doing this. I like doing that. I like doing this. But everybody keeps telling me either some people say diversify, diversify, and other people say don't diversify. I, if you've watched any of my videos, I generally tend to be an advocate for being very focused and specific about the type of artwork that you do because it helps you find that niche market that you're looking for. Um, however, that being said, this, this question helps me clarify something. It helps me elaborate on that a little bit more. My career, as, as you might have heard me explain in other, in other videos, was not a straight line. I didn't say, I didn't, I wasn't born, I didn't go out of the womb and say, concept art, okay? It wasn't like that at all. I originally started where I wanted to be a cartoon animator. Okay, I wanted to be a classical cartoon animator, and that's what I studied and I was passionate about. I drew cartoons, cartoons, cartoons my whole life until I went into school and I studied fine arts because I thought that's what real artists did. And then I ended up smartening up when I went to university and I studied classical animation. And then I got out in the industry and all of the classical animation studios closed. So then after about six months, I realized I have to learn 3D. And then I learned 3D and then I realized, well, 3D isn't enough, I have to learn Flash. And then I learned Flash and then I, ugh, and the list went on and on and on and on, okay? People think that I learned all of these things because I'm a genius. No, I learned all of these things because I needed to eat. <laughs> I was trying to find a way to eat. Um, do I feel that the experience that I gained as a 3D animator, as a 3D modeler, as a, uh, as a classical animator, as a you know, learned how to do Flash and all of that kind of stuff, and and eventually got into concept art and illustration. Do I feel like any of that is a waste of time? Not at all. In fact, I feel quite the opposite. Um, if it, In fact, if it wasn't for the fact that I learned 3D, I never would have become a director because at the time when I was, I was uh, one of the studios that I was working for, I was hired as a lead concept artist, but after two weeks, when they realized that I understood the 2D and 3D pipeline well, I got bumped up to artistic director and the that job and the the artistic direction jobs that followed that that followed suit were uh were because of that that background i had in 3d which was very important for the video game industry and for film industry furthermore i also teach 3d animation i also teach classical animation as well right so none of my experience was wasted not only that but to add to this my particular style of artwork was greatly influenced by my knowledge of 3D because I was working in a realistic environment. I had to learn all of the different properties of light. I had to start understanding the science of light, of 
ray tracing and and you know uh, penumbra and all of these different all of this different terminology and furthermore see physical examples of how lighting functions on a real three-dimensional object from a computer standpoint for something that's a lot more uh, has the a lot more computational power than I do in terms of its ability to render out lighting, right? So I learned tons from that kind of stuff. Um, however, I didn't. What what I when I originally learned three D, I already was at the time I was already a two D artist, and then I learned three D. So what my what my old portfolio, if we go back about you know if we go back years and years, my original portfolio was two D, three D. And flash I had all three of those things okay and um, I didn't get any jobs specific jobs based on my portfolio the only jobs that I ever got were the only jobs I ever got was when I created a PDF giving examples of exactly what it was that I wanted to apply for okay like they were looking for concept art so I'd go and extract all of my concept art from my website and I'd stick it into a PDF and I would I would mail that that's what got me the jobs and funny enough, even though I knew 3D and I knew 2D, I did get the odd job in 3D and stuff like that. And I, enjoy, I enjoyed it because I love animating. I, it wasn't me. It wasn't my passion, you know? So my learning curve was very, uh, uh, it was like pulling a rusty cart up, a, up an uphill slope. When I got into two, when I when I decided, you know, I'm a 2D artist and this is what I really have to focus on. This is really my passion. My learning curve went whoop, like this. It went up very quickly. And my success in my and my how I move forward in my career improved as well. So what I would say is, although the type of work that you produce, if you're going to put your artwork up on a portfolio, on your gallery, only put up the stuff that you're good at. Okay. But if you're still in the learning process and you like doing illustration, you like doing sketches of helmets, we all do it. I do it too. You know, I do a little bit of everything all the time too, right? I practice it all the time. I keep that as, uh, and I, whenever there's new softwares that come in, uh, new different techniques that come in, I learn them. I pick them up and I and I learn them just to see if there's stuff that that one software can do that another can't. Is there a way of I can improve my workflow using this software versus another? But at the core of all of that, I'm a two, I'm a traditional artist. That's the core of who I am. So anything that I bring into my world is to complement and help strengthen the my my foundation which is traditional artist. I don't, what I don't do is say, oh, maybe I should be a 3D animator for a little while. And I float off there and then I come back saying, no, that didn't work. Oh, maybe flash. And you end up like zigzagging through life instead of finding a, a nice straight path through life. That's my personal perspective. Um, but of course, if you're somebody who gets bored easily and you do have the capacity to pick up on lots of different things and be very proficient at it, and you're, you're a good example of real professional quality work, stick it on your website. Because that you remember, you're fashioning the career that suits you, not me. All right? All right, this next question comes, uh, this one's in French, and it is from Jonathan Donino. It's, uh, Bonjour, je suis la plupart, uh, je suis la plupart de vos tutoriaux que je trouve très intéressants. J'ai d'ailleurs progressé grâce à eux. Je trouve qu'il y a juste un petit bémol, ce qu'ils sont intégralement en anglais. Euh, je pense que je ne serai pas le seul ravi de vous suivre un minimum en français. Sinon, je vous souhaite une bonne, euh, une bonne continuation. Mes salutations. Euh, merci pour cette question. C'est une très bonne question. C'est une question qui qui, que j'ai considéré beaucoup quand j'ai commencé mon, ma, mon, ma page YouTube. Euh, mes premiers, mes, je, vais, je vais tromper avec mes, mes masculins et mes féminins, mais les premiers vidéos que j'ai faites, comme euh, euh, Poupée Vaudou, par exemple, étaient faites en anglais et français. Ce que j'ai trouvé, c'était que ça prend beaucoup de temps à produire ces vidéos. Beaucoup, beaucoup de temps. Ça, dépendant de la vidéo que je fais, ça, ça peut prendre plusieurs jours ou, ou même des semaines à produire une vidéo comme ça. Puis là, après, faire la traduction après, ça double la longueur de temps que ça prend pour faire des vidéos. Et... J'ai continué de faire ça pendant un petit bout de temps, puis j'ai trouvé un certain point qu'il y avait presque personne qui m'ont répondu en français. Il y avait presque personne qui, ont, euh, 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 qui était intéressé dans les vidéos. Il y avait quelques-uns qui avaient vraiment apprécié ça, mais la plupart des gens euh, étaient toujours des anglophones qui m'ont répondu à mes, à, mes, à mes vidéos. Et ce que j'ai trouvé aussi, c'est que si tu regardes, un très bon exemple, c'est de regarder, si tu as un, une, une page YouTube, Check les, euh, les euh, YouTube Analytics, puis tu vas trouver que euh, tu, peux, tu, tu peux voir immédiatement le nombre de gens, le pourcentage de gens des différents pays qui écoutent tes, tes vidéos. 
Et ce que j'ai vu, c'est que numéro un, pour moi, c'était des États-Unis. Deuxième, c'était Angleterre. Troisième, c'était Canada. Et au Canada, la plupart étaient des anglophones, puis il y avait peut-être quelques-unes au Québec qui, qui parlaient en français ou, ou qui écoutaient les vidéos en, en français. Puis moi, je voulais vraiment faire ça. Même chose avec mon, mon école, avec Lucy de Pexel. Mais après produire plus que 120 vidéos, puis la demande n'était pas là nécessairement pour produire les vidéos. Toutes mes étudiants francophones sont, sont aussi au Québec, au Cégep au vieux, du Vieux-Montréal où, où, où j'enseigne. Je trouvais ça vraiment, euh, euh, c'était vraiment, ça vaut pas la peine, puis ça double la longueur de temps. Puis moi, je veux produire plus de contenu pour tout le monde, plus de vidéos, plus d'instructions. Euh, puis ça, ça ralentit mon travail énormément. Puis en plus de ça, j'ai mon école, euh, la vraie école où j'enseigne à Brick and Mortar School. Puis là, j'ai mon école en ligne, puis là, je travaille à la pige, puis là, il y a plein de choses à faire. J'ai pas vraiment le temps pour faire tout ça. Sauf s'il y avait beaucoup de demandes pour quelque chose. Pour une vidéo, s'il y avait une vidéo qui était très, très populaire, puis vous voulez le voir en français, là, je le traduirais. Mais sinon, ça ne vaut, ça vaut, ça vaut pas le temps que ça prend pour produire les vidéos, dans le fond. Mais si jamais il y a quelque chose qui vous intéresse, mais vous préférez avoir quelque chose en français, vous pouvez toujours me contacter. C'est juste ça. Puis là, si tu veux discuter quelque chose ou si tu veux prendre un cours avec moi, là, les cours, les don les cours que je donne, les vidéos sont anglais, mais j'enseigne mes étudiants, sont les anglophones et les francophones. Alors, généralement, les, les francophones qui prennent mon cours comprennent l'anglais. Ils peuvent suivre les cours. Mais là, après, euh, durant le, le temps personnel, nos sessions par semaine, les trois heures, c'est toujours 100% en français. Alors ça, si, si tu es confortable avec quelque chose comme ça, pour tout le monde qui écoute, qui sont des francophones, là, c'est quelque chose qui est faisable. D'accord? Uh, just, and just to repeat that in, in uh, English, um, uh, Jonathan is saying... Um, He says, I find your videos very interesting. Um, I'm making a lot of progression because of them. Uh, the one thing that I find a little bit that bugs me a bit is the fact that they're mostly in English. And he was saying, um, uh, je pense que je serais pas le ravi de ce en français. He was saying, he was just basically asking if it'd be possible to make more videos in French. Uh, if not, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I love it and, uh, and take care. Okay, and my answer to, to Jonathan was I put a lot of consideration into that. That was something that I really put a lot of consideration to it. You'll notice that it, my first videos that I put out on my YouTube channel, and I noticed when I was saying this in French, I was also scratching behind my ear. I've got a little mosquito bite behind my ear. Um, when I first put up my first video, I did the voodoo doll, and the voodoo doll I originally did in English and French. And what I learned with that first video was I wanted to reach out to everybody, you know, especially since I can speak both languages, why am I going to alienate? Uh, uh, you know, no, half of myself, essentially, because I'm from Quebec. Um, it didn't make any sense for me. And I put the video out, and what I realized in the production of that video, essentially translating something from English to French doubles the length of time that it takes. So if you take two weeks to produce a video, you know, they don't always take that long, but if it took me two weeks to, to produce a video, then if I want to translate it, that makes it four weeks. That really slows me down. Now, from just from a business perspective, if I think of it from a business perspective, my YouTube channel, my online school and all of that stuff, um, it has to be worthwhile for me to produce, to, to double the amount of work that I'm going to be doing. Um, it has to be worth it, right? It, I have to have enough demand, enough viewers in French that are demanding that of me. If that happens, guaranteed I'm going to start doing them in both languages but that hasn't happened and when I put out the voodoo doll tutorial in English and French the English response was much bigger than the French response um, like greatly outnumbered it uh, simply because there's a larger demographic of anglophones out there so for me um, my uh, my real my brick and mortar school uh, students at uh, Cégep of Old Montreal I teach entirely in French it's a French school I teach entirely in French I don't speak a word of English there uh, but for my online school my online school isn't just for Quebec my online school is for the whole world and the common language the universal language is generally English right there's definitely a lot of French as well French and Spanish as well But the general, the, the language that pretty much everybody speaks is English. And when, he were, when we're thinking for my school, I have over 120 lessons. That took me months to produce. It was a huge job. And I, I just didn't have the time or, the, or the, the, the demand to double my work to do one entirely in French. Now, if I get, you know, if, if, if 100 people come up to me and say, Adam, can I take your course in French? Then cool. Now, what I do do in my school is I teach um, 
the the videos are in English, but for my students that are French, my one-on-one sessions, my three-hour one-on-one sessions every week, they're done entirely in French. If you're a Francophone, then, I, then we speak in French, right? Uh, but the videos, I just didn't want to double up that that length of time and work that went into producing them unless the demand was there. And so far, it hasn't. Now, the other thing I mentioned in French was um, uh, a good way to find out who's watching your videos, if you have a YouTube channel, is go and check out your uh, YouTube analytics. And you can do the same thing with Google. There's Google Analytics. There's all kinds of analytics you can check out. Um, you just have to install the code on your website. And what you can do is find out exactly who's watching it, what demographic it is. And my particular, uh, my, my demographic, the, the crowd that generally reaches out to me is number one, the US, number two is the UK, and number three is, uh, is Canada. Well, Canada, my country that I'm from, is actually third on the list. US is like by a big margin, and then the UK, and then Canada. So as you can see, they're all English-speaking countries, essentially, except for Canada, but I don't know where in Canada. I can't specify whether or not they're strictly from Quebec or not, right? Um, so yeah, but if you ever have questions, if you never need feedback during, during my Q&A sessions or anything like that, or in my school, French, I have no problem with that whatsoever. I love it. All right, so uh, so feel free to, to communicate with me in French or English on my channel. Sean Gagnon writes, where did you get your brushes? They're amazing. Well, thank you very much. I've gotten my brushes from multiple different sources, purchasing tutorials from different artists uh, on DeviantArt, finding them online through Google search, gifts from people, uh, from other artists who said, check out these great brushes. I've probably filtered through and tested in my time, my photo, my years of Photoshop experience, probably tens of thousands of brushes. But I like to keep my brush palette very small. You know, I have a relatively large brush palette, but I know people that have like 10,000 brushes in their in their palette. I keep mine down to a minimum, but only the ones that I know that I'll get regular use out of. Um, I don't like to download and have to test brushes. And furthermore, the way I label them, I, I do take the time to label all of my brushes, not based on, you know, anything abstract I, I or what I think they might be. I label them based on how they feel. So dry, chalky rub, uh, you know, graphite rub on, you know, on Arsh's paper or uh, soft, fluffy cloud, dirty, rough, gritty cloud. You know, like, so when I look at it, I can immediately get an idea of what to expect from the brush. Now, if you want it, if you can see here, I've got my, uh, this is my website. This is adamduff.com. If you go to tutorials and forums, you're going to get Adam's brushes right here. You click on it, and right there you can you can purchase it for free. It's a free download, of course, but you can donate if you want. My personal recommendation for a donation is $16,000. Or nothing if you don't feel like it. All right, so that's where you can get my brushes. All right, my next question comes from somebody whose name I, very sadly, and I apologize, embarrassed, but I, 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 I don't know. I can't read that um, uh, at all. Not even phonetically, but it's a very good question nonetheless. So uh, the question is, I wouldn't expect this dark and transitional video you're talking about to still be up, he asks. Really curious what clicked for you. What he's referring to, or she, what, what this person is referring to is um, there, was a per there was a period in my artistic career, something I've referred to many times in the past, where something clicked for me artistically, where I finally understood that transition into the type of art that I wanted to produce. And that was actually happened while watching one of Darkin's videos years back. We're going back a long time ago. Now remember, I've been drawing my whole life, so it wasn't like I was starting from scratch. But there was a certain mental transition that I had to make in my brain in order to really fully grasp a particular style of art that really interested me the most, the path I really wanted to take. And it was actually, if I'm not mistaken, um, it was watching his... What the hell is it called again? Uh, it's still online. It's his uh, Lich, Lich Priest? Is it Lich Priest? It's the skeletal character holding the dagger with the pauldrons. It's kind of like of an undead. And I was watching the process, just listening to him talk, just listening to the process and everything like that. And just how he explained it, something sunk in, something, it was like, you know, I was talking about the learning curve where you try practice, 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 and then whoop, you make that leap. Well, that video triggered a leap, a big leap for me, probably one of the biggest. And, you know, Darkin, if you're listening, thank you. <laughs> Very sincerely, you've con you, his, Darkin's work has contributed a lot to me. I, I really respect his work. And uh, that was essentially what it was. Now, artistically, one of the things that made my transition from the big, the big transition, if you want to know what it is, is how did I make that transition from line art to paint, essentially, at least digital painting, because I, I studied fine arts as well, from line art to digital painting. You know what it was? 
it was reversing my value scheme. When you're working in when you're working on a piece of paper, it's always black on white. So what you're focused on is the shadows, right? Essentially what you're rendering is shadow. You're not rendering light, you're rendering shadow. Traditionally speaking, unless you're working on a dark piece of paper, right? When I made that transition into painting, into digital painting especially, I made that mental transition from dark to light. So instead of painting dark, I was painting light. It completely transformed my artistic process. All of a sudden, my study of light changed, my application of light changed, my understanding of three-dimensional form changed, everything changed. And that, if you're, if you're at a point in your career right now where you're, where, you're, where you're trying to make that transition yourself, or you're trying to push past line art and get more comfortable with painting, that's what I suggest. Don't paint a line drawing and then add shadows to it. Block in a dark shape and then throw light on it. Okay, that's my little tip to you. All right, my next question comes from from Matt. Oh, Matt, uh, from uh, Matt Maurizio, one of my former students at the school. Um, how you doing, Matt? Uh, he writes, "Hey, Adam, great idea and wonderful suggestions. Thank you, former student. Do you think uh, talking about finding your style? Ah, yes, that question. Among this ocean of artists, styles, software, is finding your style is it just something that spontaneous hap spontaneously happens, or is it research?" Good question, Matt. Um, uh, that's a very good question, and yes, it's of course the, the big one, right? That's the big one. That's like that's like asking the question, uh, "Where are we from?" <laughs> um, uh, on the surface, as far as growth and learning and everything, it comes from every single source. It comes from research. It comes from uh, uh, spontaneous thoughts. It comes from visualizing. It comes from uh, every experience you have in life. I've, one of the things I like to describe it as is kind of like playing with the law of attraction, if you know anything about the law of attraction. It's basically where when you're open to certain things, they come to you if you really, really want them, right? And when you're really striving for growth artistically, then you can derive it from pretty much any source that comes your way, you know, from fixing your computer to hairdressing to plumbing to whatever, right? But I'm always open to absorb info. I'm always open to learn a lesson from any walk of life. Some of the best lessons I've learned artistically came from things that weren't even artistic. You know, they were from talking to lawyers or watching documentaries or whatever the case might be. Um, but at the core, if you want to get right down to the core of finding your style, what that's all about, all about, it's not, I find it's not so much about what you do do. Well, it is partially about what you do do. Yes, I said do do. You can get the giggle out of there. Okay. It's not because it's not what you do do, but it's what you, also what you don't. Okay, and what I mean by that is one of the things I don't do is look at other people's artwork when I'm producing anything. I never ever ever look at other people's artwork when I'm painting. Why? Because it's great and it's gorgeous and it's beautiful and it's fucking distracting. Okay, it's distracting. It pulls me away from my own vision. My vision is its best when it's left alone. And if I'm going out to find different ideas, I don't look towards other artists for ideas. I really focus on my own vision on how I want that to come through. And somebody who really explained it well was uh, Guillermo del Toro, the director. Okay, the, Of course, I'm sure you all know him, one of my personal favorites. And he, uh, during his interview with, uh, with, Rodri with uh, Rodriguez uh, in his Rodriguez's Beautiful studio with his frickin' wall-to-wall Frank Frazetta originals. Thank you. That's, if you're listening, Rodriguez, then uh, that's me being extremely jealous of your collection. Um, Guillermo says, um, uh, he says, when he was designing for Pacific Rim, the last thing he looked at was robots. He avoided looking at other designs of robots. He looked at mechanics, he looked at tanks, he looked at all kinds of different things, animals. He never looked at other robots. Why? Because that's essentially stealing somebody else's idea or, or de redesigning somebody else's idea. There's no originality. There's none of himself in there, right? And that it rings so true to the creation process. When I'm creating artwork, I research, I take photographs, I look up imagery but not paintings i look up different images that i can integrate into my piece something that influences me my one of my latest pieces my uh, cave dweller character uh the creature with the four arms the eyes the, the eyes came from this type of monkey and the the all of the spuds and things came out because i was there was two things that i was i was in the caves that day so i was watching uh i watched the movie the descent which is a complete shit painting uh shit, shit film but i digress or as they said in the movie descent shite 
and um, really crappy film <laughs> and uh, um, uh, documentaries on caves as well. The on Netflix they have the uh, the life documentaries, the Planet Earth documentaries, and there was the one on caves that really had a, inspired me a lot, to put me into that headspace. That's the kind of stuff I was watching. Um, but I did not look at other people's artwork because as soon as you do, you get so bedazzled by their unique style that you forget about your own, right? You forget about your own form of expression. That's very often what I find is the biggest distraction and the biggest delay. So what you want to do is just train yourself in the fundamentals. Always be open to inspiration for ideas. Your ideas, your visual storytelling is where it's all at. That's where all that cool stuff comes out. And when you're researching, research the things that inspire you, but not the artists that inspire you. All right? So that should hopefully answer that. All right, the next question comes from Torchit. He says, thanks a gazillion for the series, Adam. One of the, I'm one of those shy people. I'm so shy that I can't even find my style. That word again. I get easily fooled by speed paintings here on YouTube. My mind goes like, how the heck can the artist get those kinds of results in just a few minutes? But the drawing took actually a few hours or more. And then when I'm in front of Photoshop with a few brush strokes on the page, I get frustrated because I've got nothing. Close Photoshop and do something else. In short, how do I deal with this frustration? Very good question. This is my this is my feelings about about speed painting. Okay, remember I come from classical animation where where you know it's a minimum of twelve to twenty four images per second, sixty seconds per minute, sixty minutes per per uh, uh, sixty minutes per per hour, uh, huge 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 amount of work. Okay, and then I went from there and I studied fine arts and in fine arts it's about expression it's about getting lost in a painting it's about playing with texture it's about taking your time fine artists are very often celebrated for taking more time for doing a painting than less artists who were you know master artists were pressured if you look at artists like leonardo da vinci for instance you know he very often the whoever whichever um with whichever person commissioned him to do a painting would get incredibly frustrated with him because they were always saying, you know, we need the painting, we need the painting. And he said, it'll be fucking done when it's fucking done. That was kind of his attitude. It caused him some headache through his career, but it also ended up resulting in one of the greatest artists of all time, right? So you can't knock him for that. And I kind of came from that headspace where time was never an issue. Um, and then all of a sudden digital painting came out. And when that came out, and it's only, think about it, digital, digital painting is a very, very young industry. It's gone very mainstream, but it's very new. And um, a lot of people were starting to show off the fact that they were doing speed paintings. And this was kind of my, my thought on it. It's kind of like, you can compare it to um, uh, dance choreographies. I watch a lot of dance choreographies and stuff like that. And there's, to me, there's a very clear distinction between people who are dancing and people who are trying to show off how many spins they can do per, se per second, you know? And, you know, you have these certain choreographies where it's flowing and it goes with the music and it's grounded and it's beautiful and it's, and it's emotional and it, it fills you with emotion and adrenaline. And other ones where, you're, where the only thing you could possibly do at the end of it is going, wow, that was really fast, okay? It's spin, 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 flip, 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 boom, boom, boom. And, and the looks on their faces, you can see the veins popping out in their head and they're all like freaking out and trying to keep up with the tenso, tempo of this incredibly fast music. And at the end of it, I haven't been touched emotionally. I haven't been affected emotionally by this. I've just been kind of like somebody, it's like somebody basically grabbed my head and for 20 minutes went, you know, and I'm like, God, at the end of it, okay? Yes, you have a gold star for for endurance you know great you're in great shape now go teach aerobics <laughs> that's not dance now when i compare that to to working in painting digitally the only thing you're essentially showing off as a speed painter is the fact that you're fast but it's not necessarily showing off your quality as an artist what are you what are you giving me as far as an experience is concerned apart from praising you for your ability to do something fast and I'm very much one who, who is much more focused on taking the long shortcut, doing it right, taking your time, putting a lot of thought into things, and when you, your execution is very deliberate. You know when you talk about confident brush strokes, you know, very often, you know, one of my students, uh, Antonio actually, was, was talking about how one of the things he wanted to work on was having more confident brush strokes. A confident brush stroke, you cannot get a confident brush stroke by going, <laughs> you get a confident brush stroke by thinking, controlling your hand pressure, and making a very deliberate stroke and, and 
considering that stroke throughout the entire movement okay it's a control like if it was a dance it's a controlled movement where you're taking all of your limbs and the flow of energy through your body as you're moving right you're not just going right it doesn't serve any purpose you do that more often and what you're doing is you're strengthening your muscles you're developing your hand to eye coordination so when you do do a slightly faster stroke you're get you're you're getting a lot of information in very, in a very small movement you're not you know very often when you first start drawing it's very sketchy we call it chicken scratch lines right and then what you want to do is be able to capture that entire thing in a single movement and maybe there's some size variation or opacity variation in that one stroke so you want to get a drop of water instead of going like that to get your drop of water you're going whoop, and you get your drop of water but you have that hand to eye coordination you 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 train that part of your of your body and that train that part of your mind through careful consideration of your work Bobby Chu wrote this in an article a couple of years ago that I read and I love this he said the speed of a painting is not on how fast your hand moves but how much consideration is put into your brush stroke before you do it and I was like well said you know I like hearing somebody who's as reputable as Bobby Chu say that because people listen to him you know and and I like I, I respected the fact that he's guiding artists in the right direction and when you watch Bobby Chu paint he's not he's not doing this shit every one of his brush strokes are very deliberate he's got a lot of hand to eye coordination he's taking his time and thinking a lot he's visualizing a lot and that's where speed of execution comes out now I work professionally I've done hundreds and hundreds of contracts I've worked for studios I've done all kinds of stuff at no point in time has been painted painting like this ever served me any good in my career ever okay yet if I have an hour and a half to, to execute a uh, character design it's done in an hour and a half because I put the thought into it I visualize it I know how to block things in I'm very very methodical with the way I paint but I'm at no point in time am I moving fast so that whole speed painting trend in my opinion it's just showing off really and I know there's a lot of people that are gonna say Adam you know there's blah, 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 whatever I don't agree with you <laughs> I don't agree with you if that's your opinion you're not you if you're if you're trying to convince a beginner artist that that's the way to get better in my opinion you're misleading them okay just focus on quality focus on thoughtfulness fo focus on emotion and expression and focus on your end result by the time this painting is finished I want it to live up to this standard and if you can't get there yet learn something new and build yourself up slowly but surely until you get that result you're looking for and when you achieve it in that painting the next time you do a painting it's gonna take you half as long because you've made so many valuable discoveries along the way right and our last question comes from uh, Dfad Sastasad. Dfad Sastasad. I don't know if that's a real name. If it is, I hope I didn't I didn't butcher it too much. Uh, and the question is, it's a very simple one. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, in regards to my demons series, I'm assuming. Are you a fan of Hellraiser? Um, <laughs> I wasn't when I was a kid. Uh, when Hellraiser first came out, I really didn't care for it at all. I didn't care for Mad Max, I didn't care for Hellraiser, I didn't care for any of that stuff. And it's funny how the human brain works. When I was young, certain films that didn't do anything for me, probably because they were a little bit too mature for me at the time, I, I learned to love after. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Hellraiser today, although I haven't watched it in many years, so I would have to kind of have a, a, an adult perspective of it, and, and I'll get back to you on that one. Um, however, there's certain films that I thought were, you know, were... were you know the best things on earth when I was a kid and had these and carried these fond memories of the film and then I revisited those films uh, when I was older and realized what absolute utter garbage they were <laughs> a good example of that oh god was the film Hellraiser uh, not Hellraiser it was the film uh, uh, Never Ending Story when I was a kid I loved that movie I loved that movie and I remembered it being this awesome film and I was I, I, I reminisced about watching it again and a couple of years ago I watched it again after you know 25 years of not seeing it and I saw it and I'm watching it and I'm sitting there going oh my god this is so bad oh my god it was and that queen that girl god she was annoying with her little pursy lips always talking like this all the time I was like god she's gonna strangle the little kid you know like, god she was driving me horrible movie so am i a fan of hellraiser you know what i'm gonna do uh i'm gonna watch it again i think that's what i'm gonna do i think it's i think it's been long enough that i need to revisit that film 
And I'm definitely going to see Mad Max. That's for sure. Because <laughs> nobody can shut up about that film. I'm dying to see Mad Max as well. So, uh, all right. So that's it for, the, for my questions. Uh, hopefully you got something from that. And again, I want to thank you very much for all of your awesome support. You've all been absolutely fantastic. It's been, it's been a wonderful trip. And hey, it's just going to keep on going. There's more and more content. It's just going to keep getting better. And of course... If you have any questions, let me know on my YouTube channel. Uh, remember to like and subscribe if you like what you're watching. And uh, leave questions because you'll get a chance not only to, to get the answers you're looking for, but everybody else will as well. All right? So take care.